Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for giving another opportunity that uh, uh, we as the body of Christ could come together and uh, participate in the uh, activity of uh, learning your word and uh, the doctrines of Christian faith. Lord, I pray your grace may be granted to us and you open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to receive and perceive the new realities of you and the new depths of your love and uh, how you are uh, related to us and how we are we are to relate to you and the people around us Lord. as we explore it together we want to hear your voice through our pastor who is uh, who is teaching us this evening lead us and guide us and every word that we speak and the thoughts that we have in our hearts and the time we spend here lord may be beneficial to one another and uh, we are as a body of press we all together may be knit together we may be knit together and edified and equipped reflecting your glory lead us in the next one hour that we spend in study of your scripture in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you praveen and uh, uh would like to welcome vincent who is also joining us this evening uh, what a pleasure to have you all uh, on our uh, uh, bible study online bible study today today we are moving to uh to a new section in our uh, booklet which we have called we believe once again i can just show you that uh uh this is uh, what we are been using as our uh, uh study material and this is available on the gci website uh, if you any one of you need a copy you can just uh, text praveen and he can send you uh, a copy of this now today we we study section 11 but i wanted to just mention that we had skipped one section which is titled the church the reason we will study that later is we are wanting to complete the uh, lecture series that we have been uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, listening to uh, being given to us by dr gary dedo and uh, this is every saturday morning 6:30 india time uh, he comes on and gives us a lecture which i think uh, in the us anil it will be probably uh, i'm not sure uh, 6:30 yeah so if uh, 9 at night yeah right so if uh, you are uh, if you want some heavy theological material at 9 o'clock in the night for you you can tune in <laughs> is that every every morning? every every saturday every right. saturday and we have already finished about 6 uh, or 7 saturdays and we are moving into uh, you know the later part of the book we are studying the book of acts and basically studying the nature of the church so we'll come back to that uh, 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 you know sometime later but today we uh, are going to study uh, the gospel that is the title of uh, section 11 the gospel and uh, i think praveen is going to put it up on the screen and yes and so we will go ahead and start reading uh, these are all question and answers uh, i will read the question and, and then i will also read the answer uh you can follow along with me then i will stop and make some comments and uh as always if you have any questions you may write them down and we will have at least 20 25 minutes to discuss questions so we are moving now to the uh, first question what is the gospel all right you can i'm sure can uh, hope you can see it on the screen the answer reads the gospel is the good news of the kingdom of god and salvation by god's grace through faith in jesus christ to preach the gospel is to proclaim the fulfillment of god's purposes through the sending of the eternal son of god in the power of the holy spirit to break into our fallen world overthrow its evil and transform and redeem all who were captive to sin and evil's power and eternal consequences that was a pretty long sentence <laughs> so 
so the first question asks, what is the gospel? Let's uh, just let me just unpack one or two aspects of what we just read. The Greek word for the uh, for gospel is uh, evangelio. Once again, my my pronunciation may be completely faulty, but that is how the Greek reads uh, in English, which basically means we all know good news. But it can also mean good story, right? Uh, we are being introduced to a very interesting story. The gospel is the story of God and God's relationship with human beings. And that is what Jesus came to announce, all right? I think the Anglo-Saxon word God spell is what is the root word for gospel, right? God spell gospel. So good news, good story. Uh, and so the, the answer tells us that the gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God and salvation by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Notice the various uh, you know, elements of the gospel. Kingdom of God, salvation, God's grace, Jesus Christ. In other words, they are all, this is the inclusiveness of the gospel. They are all connected, right? When we talk about the kingdom of God, you cannot leave out Jesus Christ. You, when you talk about salvation, you cannot leave Jesus Christ. When you talk about God's grace, you cannot leave Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is the very center of the center of the gospel, right? He is indeed the, uh, what do you say, the lead character in the whole story, all right? So, uh, and there is another very interesting thought I'd like to bring in. Uh, uh, the, the answer also alludes to the fact that, you know, it is to proclaim the fulfillment of God's purpose through the sending of the eternal Son of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you notice something very interesting there? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is a Trinitarian participation. Pardon me if some of you might find the word Trinitarian a little jarring, but uh, you know, you can just never ignore the, that threeness of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of them participate in the gospel. And that is something that we just cannot, uh, you know, leave out. Uh, all, all of them are involved in it. Now, what is the gospel? Basically, what is this good news? It is breaking, this kingdom is breaking into a fallen world uh, or to overthrow its evil. All right. And we are captive in a fallen world. Um, it's very interesting that it talks about this fallen world. What is this fallenness, right? What is this fall? I mean, this is a theological uh, expression. It is not found in the scriptures, but perhaps it is, it is indirectly mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, we talk about human beings trapped in a fallen world or in fallenness. The word fallen refers to something that uh, happened aeons ago. We can't calculate when it was. Uh, I'm sure you will remember where the fallenness took place. I can give you a hint. Isaiah chapter 14. You remember? Somebody fell from heaven. <laughs> okay. So the fallenness goes back to that. Okay. There was a fallenness that took place with an archangel that tried to rebel against God. An archangel that tried to think that he knows better. And fallenness is what has now become uh, you know, part of our world because this same fallen angel began to, 
you know, influence human beings. And today, unfortunately, we bought into his story. <laughs> we bought into the story of Lucifer who became Satan. And we swallowed that story. But Jesus Christ has come and brought a new story, a good story. It's called the gospel. It is called good news. And that is the fact that Father, Son, Holy Spirit now is going to break into this fallenness and free us from the captivity that we have been in. Okay, so I think that should be sufficient. Uh, let's go to question number two. Question number two, uh, as you will see on the screen, reads, what are the central events of the gospel? And the answer is as follows. The central events of the gospel are about Jesus. His birth, life, ministry, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Notice the string of, uh, you know, aspects uh, when we talk about the gospel and we talk about Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, through these events in the life of Jesus, God's kingdom has broken into our time and space to bring about our salvation. Okay. So, the central events of the gospel, once again, I'll just pause and uh, uh, just uh, point you to some important uh, aspects of that, uh, that answer. The central events of the gospel is Jesus Christ, right? Uh, it is, in other words, you could say the gospel is a person. And everything is centered around the, his, this person. His birth, life, ministry, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. So the gospel must include all of this. All right? Uh, you cannot take away any one of them. And have the whole story. Uh, the very, very, his very birth is a miracle, right? And the way he came into the world is extraordinary, unique, un, you know, unseen and unheard of in any other story. You can take even, you know, all the myth mythology of the world, and it doesn't match to this particular story that we have in the Gospels. All right. Um, so it is inclusive of what everything that Jesus did, right from his birth, right up to his ascension. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> also notice that um, God's kingdom has broken into our time and space to bring about our salvation. Perhaps another unique aspect about the Christian message, which is the gospel, is the fact that God reached us. We are constantly told we must reach God. Most other philosophies, most other religions always talk about reaching God, always talk about, you know, the ways that we can sort of uh, uh, attain, you know, connection with God. But the Christian story is inverted. It is just that God reaches us. And that is another unique aspect of uh, the gospel, the good news. And it, is, and it becomes good news because God is interested in us more than we wanting to be interested in him. And that, I think, uh, that uniqueness must be noted. Okay? Uh, let's see if we can uh, cover at least two or three more questions. Let's go back to question number three now. Question number three reads, is the forgiveness declared in the gospel extended only after repentance? All right, let's uh, go ahead and read. This could be a little controversial, but let's read it. And the answer begins by saying, no, the gospel is the astonishing good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's forgiveness of us is unconditional and it is given before our confession of sin and repentance. Freed by the Holy Spirit in response to the word of God, repentance is how we receive the forgiveness that has already been freely given to us 
on the basis of Christ's atoning work on the cross. To refuse to repent is thus to refuse God's gift of forgiveness. Okay, once again, there's uh, quite a lot there. Uh, let me just bring some thoughts uh, to your attention. Notice the question asks, is the forgiveness declared in the gospel? That is God's forgiveness of humanity, right? Uh, extended only after repentance. In other words, the question is asking, uh, uh, you know, do we initiate uh, the forgiveness of God through our repentance? Now, you know, the word forgiveness is uh, an interesting word there. Uh, the word forgiveness, and I want to ask the question, why is forgiveness part of the gospel story? If you remember Jesus Christ, I think it is a book of Mark. Uh, he says he came into Galilee uh, preaching the gospel. Right. And he said, repent. Uh, and believe the good news. Right. Believe the gospel. He uses the word repent there. Right. Uh, so there is this repentance and forgiveness very much uh, being discussed. And so my question is, why is gospel, why is forgiveness part of the gospel story? Forgiveness indicates that a decision was taken some time back. Or you could say uh, a bad decision was made some time back, which led to uh, a lot of consequences, bad consequences. A decision that was made led to evil consequences and fallenness. Remember, we discussed fallenness just a while ago. Now, that indicates that we are free moral beings. In other words, we have the ability to know good from evil and choose and be able to choose good from evil. So because we had made a decision, and of course the decision began with our parents. And of course, you know, if you go back, the decision actually took place uh, by Lucifer. Now, God needed to erase the effects of that bad decision, right? So what happened? God in Jesus, made the right decision, right? Because he took on our humanity and in our humanity, through our humanity, he turned our no to yes. We said no to God, but Jesus said yes to God. And you can see that on several occasions. Uh, Jesus' temptation, uh, when, Luce, uh, when Satan came and uh, tempted him to say no to God, uh, Jesus said yes to God. And no to Satan. So when we, he was overturning our no, you know, to a yes to God. So repentance and forgiveness shows that God wants our willing participation. He does not want us to be coerced into, you know, so called salvation. He does not want us to be forced. Uh, he does not want to go against our will. And if I can go, if I can, uh, uh, you know, be bold enough to say that God respects our will to decide. And I have an interesting verse to read to you from the book of Revelation, chapter 320. I'm sure you have read that many a times, but this comes very nicely into what we are discussing at this time. In Revelation 320, it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Notice Jesus Christ knocks on the door. He waits for us to open. To me, it tells me that he respects our will to decide. First of all, it tells me that I have the ability to decide. Secondly, he respects my will to decide whether I will open the door. And the metaphor of he coming and eating with us and, uh, you know, is basically talking about an intimate relationship. When you sit around a table and eat with people, that shows a sense of intimacy, right? When a family sits around a table, it shows a very special relationship that exists that you would be willing to share a meal. Okay, so that is the reason why forgiveness is mentioned. Because God wants our participation in the story. 
if I could say God wants to include us in the story. He wants to erase the bad story began through the decision of Lucifer and then Adam and Eve and then all of us. Uh, he wants to now include us in his story, which is a yes from Jesus to erase the no of Adam and Eve and the fallenness. All right. So let me just leave it there. So, um, so the gospel basically announces that God has already redeemed us in Jesus. So if you go back to question number two, which talks about, you know, uh, Jesus Christ's life, birth, ministry, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Basically, what it means is God has already accomplished redemption. There is nothing we do for at attaining to that redemption. All we have to do is receive the forgiveness of God. Receive the yes of Jesus. Now say yes to Jesus' yes. That is what it means, uh, basically. And that is why it is good news. It is good news because God in Jesus has already, you know, redeemed us. But we have to receive it. We have to open the door when God knocks. If we don't, we remain in darkness. We remain in isolation. We remain in loneliness. And we have no opportunity to be able to sit around that table and enjoy the banquet that Jesus Christ has planned for us. And so, once again, I, I, I refer to the fact that it is good news because Jesus Christ has already won the redemption for us. Okay, um, let me move to question number four. Uh, question number four reads, how should we respond to the gospel? All right, and uh, the answer says, with repentance and faith. The Son of God was sent by the Father to assume our human nature to himself and to rescue and transform in himself, or uh, it in himself. Uh, this was done to reconcile us to God so that we might become his beloved adopted children. Jesus Christ came, lived and died for our sins and has made us his own before and apart from being from our believing in him. He has bound us to himself by his love in such a way that he will never let go. Uh, let us go. Therefore, the Lord calls on all humans to repent. And believe in him as Lord and Savior. All right. <clears throat> uh, just uh, once again, let's uh, uh, look at one or two aspects. So the question reads, how should we respond to the gospel? And it says, with repentance and faith. Let me just go back to that thought on repentance again. Uh, once again, I should bring the Greek here. Uh, the Greek for repentance is metanoia. Uh, pardon me for my pronunciations there, which basically means after or behind one's mind. Very interesting, uh, you know, phraseology there. After behind one's mind, or it basically means, or what it what it uh, uh, purports to, you know, uh, uh, convey is to have another mind. <laughs> to have another mind. And what is this another mind? The mind of faith. That's why it says the way we respond to the gospel is through repentance and faith. Repentance is willing to acknowledge that the current mind we have is enmity to God, is uh, against God. But now we are willing to change to a mind of faith, a mind of acceptance, a mind of saying yes to God. And how is this made possible? As it says, the Son of God was sent by the Father to assume a human nature. It begins there. It begins with Jesus again. He came, took on our human nature, took on our enemical mind, took on our mind that is against God, and 
converted it, transformed it to say yes to God. So once again, you see the centrality of Jesus and the importance of what Jesus is doing here. He is the one who is indeed transformed the mind. And all we have to do is tap into him, tap into his mind in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, uh, and it says Jesus, as he took on our humanity, our human nature, uh, our inimical mind. Uh, it says he has bound us to himself by his love. Remember, he, he remained God. And to that extent, he was, you know, he was full of love. Uh, he bound us to himself by his love in such a way that he will never let us go. In other words, his commitment to us is genuine. It cannot be broken. It cannot be taken away unless we reject it. So his love, his commitment to us is, uh, is you know, you could say 100%. There is just absolutely no turning back as far as God is concerned. He's going to be true to himself. And the fact that God is love, his love is true to us. It cannot be, uh, you know, by any, uh, uh, you know, stretch of the imagination be negated. God will not negate that love for us. That is the very nature of love, right? Um, okay, so basically what we are saying is the way we respond to the gospel is repentance and faith to have another mind. And when your thinking process, your cognitive process is very important because our behavior is influenced by the way we think. So that is the reason why our thinking, our cognitive process is uh, something that we need to be very much aware of. How do we think, right? It is we, we make decisions through a process of the mind, a process of thinking. And behavior is always the, what do you call it? Uh, the result of the way you think. And uh, uh, when we talk about sin, it is, you know, we, we normally think only of behavior, but we don't think about the mind. But Jesus came and revolutionized that. He said the very thought is sinful. So in other words, sin is uh, much before the behavior. It is the way we think that, you know, sinfulness uh, originates. And we will talk about sin in, an, in another section. Uh, an entire section is dedicated to the concept of sin. So once again, if I can just mention, your cognitive process results in the behavior and your behavior results in your feelings. Okay, so the way you feel is because can be retraced back to the way you think, the way you behave, and then you can either feel rotten because you may have done what is wrong or you can feel good because you may have done that which is right. And God is inviting you to do that which is right. Okay. I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, there is quite a bit that we discussed. <laughs> uh, let us now open it up for some uh, comments that you'd like to make. I'm sure you may have something may have impressed upon your mind uh, as we were reading. Or if you have a question, feel free to ask a question. I'd so, like to say something. Please. I'd like to say something. Vincent speaking. Vincent, go ahead. Lovely to hear you. Go ahead. Uh, it's regarding this thinking process. If we think bad, it obviously brings uh, uh, problems to our physical body. Okay. It affects the body. I was reading a book called uh, Molecules of Emotion. Okay. Emotions, I mean, if you have good emotions, you don't face problems, physical problems, health problems. But if, let's say, somebody hates someone for a long period of time, and, it, and you, let us say, somebody hates you for a long period of time, and you don't even know about it, that person faces a problem. Cancerous tumors are formed in the body. 
and this has been uh, uh, studied by a doctor in US, forget the name, uh, Candice. Okay. And she, she said, she just studied it. She said, your emotions can heal you or your emotions can destroy you. It's something of that sort. It's like St. Paul saying, uh, think beautiful thoughts, think of wholesome things. It all uh, bears on this, uh, uh, what do you call it? What you just now said regarding thinking. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. I think you are giving a, a very scientific explanation uh, of the process of thinking and how it affects the body. Uh, like I was told that psychology, the psychology affects the physiology. <laughs> and I think the, the book of Proverbs talks about you know, the way we think uh, uh, definitely affects you know, our, uh, you know, the workings of the body. Uh, perhaps if I can just add there, uh, yes, uh, what you're saying is also proved by science. Uh, what we need to recognize here from our perspective, the spiritual you know, perspective is that Jesus Christ has, uh, you know, has made that possible through his humanity and through his, the transformation of the human nature. He has made that possible. And so we cannot... Uh, we cannot uh, think good on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the advocate to help us. Uh, many a times our thinking process can still go wrong. That is why we need the scriptures, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. We need, you know, Jesus Christ. So uh, thank you, Vincent. If anybody else want to add to that, if I might, if I might just say, Vincent, we'd love for you to repair that camera because we would love to see you too. Actually, I was trying to use my son's laptop about, that's why we got delayed, you know, it was, wasn't was working on his okay. laptop also. Okay. So later on, I'll just try to fix it. Wonderful, <laughs> yes. We'd love to see you and say hello to your family too. <laughs> okay. Yes, any, any thoughts uh, about what Vincent said or any other aspects from what we discussed so far? Anil, can you unmute? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Now, I was going to say that somewhere, doesn't somewhere in the Bible it says, transform me inwardly by a complete change of our minds. So, uh, you know, even the transformation. Uh, of the mind is uh, enabled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, yes, I think you're referring to Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans I'm chapter 12, one. I'm not sure if that is what you're referring to. Yeah, uh, probably you're right. Anybody? By complete change of our mind. Okay. Yeah, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed in your mind to know what is that good, pleasing, and acceptable. A bit of yeah. God, yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that uh, scripture? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Good old dependable Bertie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, uh, the transformation of the mind. But once again, let's remember, uh, we are incapable of doing it. Uh, we need we need help. And Jesus Christ provides that in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. Even the uh, coming to forgiveness is also enabled by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, right? We on our own cannot yeah, even accept that forgiveness. Yes, that is what now we have come to understand. Uh, once again, it points to the incarnation, Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. You see, the reason he came in the flesh is so that he can enable us. So we on our own cannot initiate repentance. That is the reason why we cannot, uh, what do you say, uh, generate salvation on our own, which is the basic premise of all other religious thought and philosophies that we need to do something on our own, which, which we are incapable of. All right. Okay.
Okay. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, we, we live in a fallen world. Yes. Uh, is man in a fallen state? Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. Uh -huh. You are saying we live in a fallen world and obviously the fallen world, which, which includes humanity. Uh, and so uh, your question is, are we in a fallen state? Yes. Yes. Obviously, obviously. But I'm not sure if you're referring to the fact that Jesus Christ reversed that. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. Are you also referring to the fact that Jesus, when Jesus Christ came, yes. he reversed that fallenness? Uh, yes. 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 We are fallen, but Jesus Christ has defeated death and reversed the fallenness, but the fullness of it is not experienced now by us. Right? If I could mention that. <laughs> uh, can I just say something? Bertie, go ahead. In 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 uh, in the book of Isaiah, uh, I'm not I'm I, I I'm not able to quote exactly which chapter and verse, but it says, "In returning, and in rest shall you be saved; in quietness and trust shall be your strength." It's very important to know this, because as you say, all that you say that Christ reversed us; He came in the humanity and made us a new creation, and we. And uh, our calling is without repentance. Uh, somewhere else is mentioned in the New Testament. In the sense that God, uh, God has uh, done it for us. And uh, Christ has reversed us, even our thinking and everything. So he offers us forgiveness and all. But we need to know this, that in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. It is very, very comforting, very strengthening to me. I, I keep uh, remembering this and it helps uh, me to have a focus on Christ. Okay, thank you for that scripture from Isaiah. It's uh, it's of course very telling. Yes. Right. Uh, Praveen, if you'd like to add something to what we have discussed, feel free to do so. Anand, go ahead, Anand. Sir, maybe this is out of context. I don't know, but does guilt help? in any way to repent <laughs> it uh, makes you realize that you're wrong okay like what mr vinton vincent is saying you know the molecules i think will it help in any way to move out of from the wrong direction to the right direction i understand that god is the one who leads us to repentance but the, the question is guilt that all of us face. Will it help in any way to repent? Well, okay. Um, uh, the way I'll answer that question is, and once again, I invite anybody else who would like to comment. Um, you know, our emotional makeup includes, the, uh, includes this feelings of guilt, right? And so I think... Uh, uh, you know, God, as he created us in his own image, uh, obviously, you know, uh, includes various faculties and aspects of our existence as a human being, which has a spiritual component and, of course, the physiological, the physical component. Human beings are very special creations. Uh, we have a spiritual dimension and a physical dimension. Dimension, And I think the guilt aspect comes uh, in this interaction, you know, in this complexity that human beings are. And what, what you're saying is, does it help in repentance? I think God made us such that all our emotional makeup and all our cognitive makeup can help in uh, moving towards, you know, uh, what do you say? Um, repentance or the fullness of the kingdom aided and helped by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we are participating with the Holy Spirit. We are participating in, in the life of Jesus, enabled by the Holy Spirit. And all the faculties of, of our mental faculties, our emotional faculties, our intelligence 
you know, all of that plays a role. And so, yes, you, I, I, I would say yes to that. Anybody else have a thought on that? Maybe we can call that as the conviction of the Holy Spirit, sir. Yeah. Uh, that guilt or whatever we may be common language, but I think it is God, the Spirit of the Lord, which uh, who convicts you that you are doing wrong. That is the feeling of guilt. So okay. it is the conviction of the Spirit. That's a good point, Joshila. I, and I remember uh, when Jesus said He will send the Holy Spirit. It, uh, it also talks about the Holy Spirit coming to convict the world, right? So conviction, yes, is is definitely a fruit of, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's active, uh, you know, involvement in our lives. Uh, I think, Praveen, you had a thought and Bertie had a thought. Uh, let's would... finish with Praveen first, Bertie. Yeah. Praveen, yeah. Uh, well said, uh, Mr. Zachariah, about how God has designed us and everything and how the Holy Spirit convicts us, more to do with uh, our, our, our beliefs and more to do with us believers, children of God, you know, uh, that we need to be in tune and help. But uh, this fact of guilt, I think, is more to do with conscience. And God uses conscience uh, in a, I mean, God you, uh, works, as you say, he works, he's a miracle working God and he can, he, you know, he does it wonderfully, you know, the way he works with our lives. But in the, in the case of uh, the heathen and the pagan, I think uh, those who do not know the true God, I think he uses conscience to either accuse them or excuse them as it's mentioned in the scriptures. So okay. guilt could be used in a way uh, with God's dealing, uh, uh, in a way with the, you know, with the uh, pagan world, with the heathen who are not in a relationship or who do not know the true God. To help them, to help them in in a way of bringing them and you know, in in the plans that God has for them. Thank you, Bertie. Yeah, go ahead, Praveen. Uh, as for me, I may not be totally aligned uh, with uh, whatever has been said uh, regarding guilt, uh, guilt, uh, and then God can use it as a tool uh, to convict us. I feel uh, guilt is actually a kind of feeling. We have these feelings and emotions. Feelings and emotions are not inputs from God. Feelings and emotions are our responses to a particular thought. Either it can be from people or it can be from God or it can be our own thought. So we all know our thoughts influence our feelings. So guilt is a feeling. So it is not uh, something that God will use uh, to convict or whatever the words we have taken. And kindly don't misunderstand. I personally feel <laughs> the word conviction and guilt has been taken as a synonym, as synonyms, but they are not. Because Bible clearly tells godly sorrow uh, uh, adds, uh, sorry, godly sorrow leads to repentance and it adds no remorse. Like uh, mm -hmm. when Holy Spirit leads us regarding I mean, convicts us regarding something that wrong we have done. He doesn't lead us towards condemnation in our heart. Guilt is always more, more towards kind of be a feeling of condemnation. So godly sorrow, what godly sorrow does is convict us about it. It points us about a wrong thought or a wrong doing that we have done. And God puts a thought in our head and tells so, so and so thing is wrong. And then he doesn't leave us there. Godly sorrow leads us to repentance, which means it connects us to Christ again. So mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit leads us, he will tell us, Pravin, see so-and-so thing you have done wrong, but fear not, Christ has settled it for you. So look unto him, depend on him, and ask him for, your, for his help to overcome it. So that's Amen. how Holy Spirit will take. So when a wrong thought came, or when we are realized, that we have done something wrong and we are feeling guilty which is natural if we are given if we have given ourselves into guilt that means we are taken out we are taken by in fact uh, to say the accuser accuser or what is the duty of accuser to make us feel guilt and to make to prove us guilty so when jesus comes or holy spirit come he will convict us about our wrongdoings but they will not confirm us guilty because we have been justified by Christ, uh, by, by the actions of Christ. The accuser does make us feel guilty and uh, he just uh, judges us guilty. 
and at the same time the moment we got the thought of guilty we con guilty feeling and that's we don't need to take we are given into uh, the accuser that is natural mm -hmm. we get but if we have given ourselves into that guilty thought then we are given ours we have given ourselves control into the accuser but when holy spirit does lead us he will convict us tells we have done wrong but you are free you are not guilty anymore because of what christ has done let's see for the support from christ so i believe this is how holy spirit will take he will not take he will not use guilt that's my just just a thought i think that's uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, perspective uh, and especially the scripture that you mentioned about godly sorrow and of course uh, the sorrow that comes from from guilt uh, and very true what you said is the accuser is the one who makes us feel guilty and while jesus christ the holy spirit frees us from guilt right uh, i think uh, it's just a matter of how you focus <laughs> uh, the the guilt uh like you said is natural because we are made in that uh you know we are made in such a way where responses of guilt comes in but thankfully the holy spirit comes to help us overcome it and feel a sense of freedom in jesus christ yeah so i think uh, uh the way you focus on it is 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 vital very good sorry murthy go ahead Uh, uh unmute yourself uh, suri murthy we can't hear you most of the humanity can you hear me yeah yeah yes yes most of the humanity carries a burden carries a huge burden uh, and the humanity does not realize that uh, i'll tell you why i said this i was also carrying this burden but after baptism a few days after the baptism i could feel my entire burden was removed and i was feeling like a small child with the feeling that the burden has been removed uh, i am not referring to any scripture and uh, i do not know how you want to understand that <laughs> and uh, and the feeling of child childness not childishness and the, and the feeling of childness still prevails there is no burden if i commit a mistake i tell i tell god oh, yes i have committed the mistake that's all there is no more burden i think this uh, this ties in with what you people are talking about the guilt okay okay it looks like you have given your burdens to jesus and now you're enjoying his rest <laughs> i'm telling you a practical example okay after after baptism after a few days after the baptism i felt the entire burden was removed yeah my yoke is my yoke is what is that that uh, easy from, my, my yoke is easy right <laughs> very easy. yes Yeah. Yes. Uh, Thank you for that for for that uh, personal experience. Yes, Anil, go ahead. Uh, I'm not too sure if, as Sri Muti says, that uh, after baptism he felt guilt free. I don't think baptism has to do anything with it. Baptism is just an outward expression of your inward conversion. But that is basically at the time of regeneration, at the time when you believe. That's when. <clears throat> you start uh, you know this guilt feeling is, is is slowly goes away i mean that's what i i think i don't know i may be wrong you want to comment on that go ahead sir i am not saying some guilt feeling was removed after the baptism after about a month or so not immediately <laughs> i could feel the entire burden in my human makeup was completely removed no i understand but i, I i'm not too sure that your that burden being removed has anything to do with baptism i i have lost the burden forever after <laughs> that i have never felt the burden <laughs> fine but that is because of your regeneration and not because of baptism 
the Holy Spirit entering. The regeneration has taken place after baptism. No, 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 no. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, it's a personal experience that Surya Murthy has felt, mm. and uh, I'm presuming that, uh, you know, his whole experience of conversion. you know uh, yeah, by the holy spirit slowly beginning to work in his mind bringing him to baptism perhaps all of those things are it's an inclusive experience of all of that where he sensed uh, you know a sense of relief so uh, maybe well, we'll leave it at that but yes uh, if i can uh, just mention what anil said baptism by itself is not magical it does not have a magical power but i think it is just a confirmation of your now uh, being included in christ which itself is a tremendous relief anyway thanks for those thoughts i can but, see that the time but, is going by we have just a few minutes left berti yes go ahead but as uh, sulamuthi says it's a part of the regeneration okay it's a it's like a journey which is a you know and you have these uh, uh, interesting uh, you know sites that you come across each <laughs> on your journey and then you have these various experiences which is wonderful yeah okay uh, any other final thoughts from anybody else those who may have not uh, had an opportunity yes franklin go ahead uh, sir uh, dr gary dedos uh, lectures are they available on youtube uh i am not sure if they are uh, immediately available but they will be available down the line yes sir are we recording it at our level are we uh, recording it no i think it is being recorded by the philippine church and they will make it available to us okay okay right. saturday uh, is i mean when he speaks on, is it is it on on the website i mean uh, how do you access it no it is it is a, li- a zoom link and if you are interested uh, anil we can send it to you please i'd appreciate yeah. that yeah we'll do that okay thank you all it is wonderful to see uh, so many of you i i i i can see well it is registered as 16 but there could be one or two duplications there uh, but thank you very much for joining in today i would request that everybody can have their camera so we can get a picture like you know <laughs> Quite a few we don't see, like uh, Ombuka, <laughs> Sheila, Vinton. <laughs> yes, uh, it's always nice to see uh, you on on the screen, but we don't want to invade your privacy. Uh, <laughs> if you have any particular reason for not, uh, you know, uh, switching on your camera, that's that's uh, that's okay. But it it will be lovely to have, you know. <laughs> Right. And uh, so let's close. And if I can request uh, Nelson Phillips, if he can lead us in a closing prayer this time. Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> our loving Heavenly Father, we come before your great and mighty throne, O Lord, to thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us on this platform to learn about you and your ways. Lord, thank you for enlightening us on so many aspects. We ask you, O Lord, to bless us with your Holy Spirit. open our hearts and minds to understand more about you and to dwell upon you and grow in your grace and in your knowledge thank you lord for this opportunity in jesus name we pray yeah. amen